Hey guys, welcome back. Today I am here with the wonderful Alphonse, as promised, and today we are gonna cover their Eason brush line. Hi there. Okay, so first question I had that I know I've told people and some don't know, because I found out from him, what does Eason stand for? <laughs> Eason is basically, uh, it's Muse backwards. You know, when we're creating our company, Muse, uh, Muse really is a platform, it's an education platform. And then when we started to create the product line that went with it and the tools, um, it was interesting. It just really kind of came down to actually seeing a, a reflection of the brush in the mirror. So we, you know, we say Eason is a reflection of beauty. Oh, I like that. And so, um, yeah, Eason is Muse backwards. I like that. It's deep. It's deep. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Like, what do you mean? What do you mean something? <laughs> Plus, uh, I couldn't get Muse. Yeah. So, Eason was <laughs> good. Had it, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So what type of hair are you guys using in your brush line? We use a variety of hairs between natural and synthetic hair. So we use um, a high grade of Taclon, that's all the black and white tipped brushes. Uh, we, use, we use uh, two varieties of goat, there's sable, there's blue squirrel, uh, there's boar, there's badger, there's pony. So there's a wide variety mm -hmm. of different types of hairs. And one thing I did want to touch on, because I know we discussed that, mm -hmm. uh, where you source your hair from, because Absolutely. some people like, you know, the fur industry and yeah, sure. is really barbaric. And Absolutely. For us, what we do is we basically work with the uh, international, uh, it is the uh, food, wool, and acrylic industry. So it is a byproduct. Obviously the acrylic is made, it's plastic, it's basically man-made, and then all of the natural hairs are pure byproducts from the food or the wool industry. Oh yeah, so that's nice. So the whole animal is being used Absolutely. instead of just being bred for the hair. And it's, it's probably the most um, eco-responsible, mm -hmm. I would say, and the most responsibly way to source brushes. Mm -hmm. I respect anyone that is vegan or doesn't want to use a certain natural hair brush. That is great. And so we have a collection within a collection, but there's a reason why some makeup artists prefer to use natural hair brushes. And so it's nice that we can have any which way we want. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of that, I found it very interesting when I was just doing like some research on how different applications work with the different hair, right. like why the cuticle matters. Sure. So would you mind touching on what Absolutely. brushes or what hair you prefer? I think what's really important to understand is like, well, why are there different color hairs? Or why are different color brushes? Or why so many different types of natural hair? Let's start there. Um, every strand of hair has uh, microscopically, like what we call, it's called cuticle. Mm -hmm. and it almost looks like fish scales, mm -hmm. uh, microscopically. And every different type of hair, just like in human hair, some hair might have more texture, some hair might have maybe baby fine texture, and it's usually all developed or it is all derived from your the cuticle. Mm -hmm. So for example, the tawny colored brushes, this is a natural sable hair brush. Sable hair has, uh, is a more texturous brush, so it has more cuticle or more open cuticle. Mm -hmm. So the wider or the more open the cuticle, the more product it can pick up and lay down, mm -hmm. giving you more control, a uh, little more of a fuller application. Mm -hmm. Whereas working, let's say, with a brush like in the S series, this is made of blue squirrel. Blue squirrel is generally um, utilized, especially for like when you're painting with watercolors. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, it's very fluid. So therefore, uh, Blue Squirrel has the most closed cuticle. It's the most delicate of the hairs. Um, and therefore, that's gonna give a little more of a sheer application. Oh, okay. And of course, in your Taclon, uh, Taclon, it's a man-made product. It's, it's original material came from DuPont. And what you'll find there basically is that with na uh, synthetic hair brushes, think of fishing line. Mm -hmm. You know, it's basically completely cylinder. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually fairly straight unless if it's been treated and sometimes just like you could perm hair, mm -hmm. you can perm tack on to give it a little bit of a wave to have a little bit of texture. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that now that you mention it, like little waves. And they do that with a hope that because there's no cuticle to pick it up, mm -hmm. they haven't been able to mimic that yet. But I think the, well, the thought process is like if it has a little bit of an S or a bend in it, that through static electricity, it will hold the pigment to lay it down. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you would say uh, the synthetic are best for cream and liquid applications Absolutely. typically? I prefer the, the most artists will use the synthetic hair for creams, liquids, maybe gels, whereas the natural hair brushes, uh, depending on like the really soft ones are ideal for powder. Mm -hmm. Sable hair is one that can, be, can go the full gambit from any medium, whether it's uh, gel, liquid, wax, uh, powder-based formulas. So where are your brushes made and how are they made? Okay, we work with a very small studio in China mm -hmm. and it basically where they all hand make brushes. So each brush is handmade, hand tied, and it is responsibly, um, responsibly made, responsibly sourced. 
Um, we've seen the studio. We've, I've worked with them now for over 15 years, even with other companies that I've worked with. And they just do a beautiful job in handcrafting all their brushes. But what I find different about your brushes is I've been using some of these um, angled brushes. I don't mm -hmm. know what the exact name for them okay. is, but I love <laughs> these. But they are very much have a purpose. Yes. Opposed to some of these big, dome, sure. fluffy brushes that I started using because sure. I was using them because everyone else was, and sure. especially on my eyes that are smaller. Okay. I would just kind of get shadow all the way up to the brow bone. It or would be a mess. Bone. And so then I'm trying to go into my crease to define my crease, and now it's above my crease. It's on so my it's lid. It's kind of a mess, and so I never really thought to try these tinier brushes. And when I watched you and some of the other makeup artists, and even Aaron that was up from LA, use mm -hmm. these brushes, it's like, okay, I need to try some of these in my right, crease. Cool. And I do, I love this, 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 and this. Those are my favorite for my eyes. Those are great. So the brushes are broken down. Thank you, first of all. <laughs> and uh, that actually is a lot of the intention that went behind uh, creating these brushes. The first row here, you more or less have your complexion brushes. Uh, the second row is more for eye shading. And you would look at that and say, well, that's a lot of different types of brushes for just eye shot up. Mm -hmm. And then of course the bottom row here is more for fine detailing and what you do to detail your work. Um, when it comes to the brushes, let's say, I'll talk about these two in particular. Let's take them from here. So either one of these brushes are and are used and can be used for contouring the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is made of blue squirrel, so it's really soft. It's gonna give you a soft sheer application. Most commonly, this is what they call the windshield wiper brush, mm -hmm. just to give like a little bit of shading. This one is made of sable. So sable is a more open cuticle. It's gonna pick up a little more product. It's a little more durable. Um, it's gonna lay down more product. But what makes it really unique is the amount of whip and snap that a brush would have. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this brush, you can do this so I can see it on the camera. Oh, and real quick, what brushes are those? So this is S33, and this one is W35. W stands for weasel, which is sable, S is for squirrel. So if I think, if you take a look at this one, this one, if you move your finger, how it moves, that's called whip. And then when it springs back, that is the snap. How quickly does it snap back into shape? So this is made of blue squirrel, which is soft and delicate. Whereas you have your sable whip and snap, it springs back. You can actually feel it. And for makeup artists, the reason why an, an artist of any type loves sometimes working with sable hair brushes is because it does give you that whip and snap. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier, it's like doing, um, you're painting a portrait and you're gonna paint like little delicate fine eyelashes. Mm -hmm. or you're doing nail acrylic art mm -hmm. and you need that small little brush. I always say, those are the ones in art supply that are behind locked glass with security guard standing yeah. there and they're like $160 for like four strands of hair on a brush. Yeah. So that's of those more delicate ones. But for a makeup artist, for someone who's doing their makeup, if you like doing a more smoky eye, if you like doing your winged eyeliner or your signature red lip, mm -hmm. a sable brush is gonna be with you the entire time and not move slowly and fan out. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the difference there between those two. Yeah, I like that. I've been using that one because my eyes are smaller to blend out after I get everything Grateful down. Blending. I've been using that mm -hmm. on the top to just blend it out. And uh, with, with the brushes, I mean, if you think about them, they're kind of, I based them off of very classic shapes that you would find really as artists use. This one's called a filbert. Mm -hmm. A filbert is basically like a, a flower petal shape. Oh, okay. Okay. And they're in three different sizes. And they're three sizes because an, as, as an artist or for anyone, we all have different size eye space. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking earlier, I make smaller brushes because smaller heads because we try to create all this beautiful, you know, replica, the Sicilian chapel on our mm -hmm. eyelids and it's only one by one in space. Yeah. And sometimes you need to have smaller brushes to create those fine details. Unless you're Rania. Rania's got, yeah, she's got she big eyes. She has beautiful space. eye space. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> jealous. <laughs> she's like, exactly. So I know I see the different handle lengths on mm -hmm. some of them. Okay. Why, what makes you choose how long they're gonna be? Sure. For the most part, um, the way we design these brushes is for them to be ergonomically correct in your hand. So every brush has what we call a knuckle. So the knuckle is more or less where you would hold it and the brush should fit comfortably right into this part. Um, and therefore it gives you an ideal application um, when it comes to using it. From there, there's also the balance. So these brushes are made from cured birch wood Birchwood grows as fast as uh, bamboo, so it's also an equally eco-responsibly source of wood. It's cured, which means it's been oiled, so it helps to keep the wood from retracting and expanding if it gets wet. The ferrules are made of solid brass, so that's not mm, very common because it adds more weight to the brush. Mm. So if you go into um, any retail environment, you buy brushes that a woman's going to carry around with her in a purse. 
you don't want them to be very heavy. Mm -hmm. Three brushes adds a lot of weight. Yeah. So generally those brush ferrules are made of, let's say like aluminum or yeah. tin or plastic. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, but your ferrule is what's going to ensure the shape of the brush head. Mm -hmm. So with this being brass, it's really strong and it's really hard, but it does create additional weight. But a brush should always be perfectly balanced between where the ferrule and the brush handle meet. And it's almost like, if you think about a hairstylist, mm -hmm. when hairstylists are doing like your hair, blowing yeah. out the, your hair, after the third, fourth client, physically it brings on a lot of uh, pressure, a lot of yeah. stress. And when they go to cosmetology school, they teach them how to stand and how to work so it doesn't exhaust them. Yeah, no carpal tunnel and things like no that No carpal too. tunnel. Yeah. So the same thing goes when it comes to doing makeup. It's one thing if you're doing your own makeup five minutes in the morning and you mm -hmm. go, or some, people, some women love to sit there and play and do their makeup all day. It's their, it's their quiet time, mm -hmm. and I get that. Um, as makeup artists, when you're doing client after client and it becomes a part of your, your trade, your brushes become an extension of your, of your vision. So therefore, we just want them to be very comfortable. So some are a little longer, some a little shorter. It depends on where you're working, um, on what part of the face. The eye brushes are generally a little bit longer mm -hmm. because you never really want to hold a brush, let's say, so close that if I was doing the makeup, my whole big hand, my fist would be in the face and it's almost like an intrusion of one space. Mm -hmm. So by keeping it onto the knuckle, it fits comfortably and allows you to do your work without putting a lot of pressure. Now, for uh, uh, the woman who's doing her makeup every day, if she needs to get really close to the mirror, I totally understand a long handle can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. But that's why there's these great magnify mirrors nowadays yeah. that allows you to actually relax into doing your makeup. Because we've seen it a hundred times, someone goes to do their wings and they're doing it, they, they hold their breath and the left wing is good, mm -hmm. and then they go to the right wing. And that one's a little thicker. And you're like, well, I'll make this one thicker. <laughs> And I'll do this one thicker. And you end up with panda eyes. You get panda <laughs> eyes or Amy Winehouse wings, which I love yeah. those too. That's great. So, you know, a brush length and a handle actually can actually help to get the job done quicker and more professionally. One thing, um, I had a Makeup Brush University video I did a while back and I was explaining to people how if you were to take your hair, or naturally when it tapers down and you were to mm -hmm. cut it, that you'd have that blunt Point. edge. So, um, one thing about your brushes too, I found interesting, you have that little, can you show? Help, uh, oh, the how they're made. Yeah. yeah, because the tips are not cut no. on your brush. So basically brushes for the most part are made one of two ways. Obviously they're either machine made, mm -hmm. um, which is a, has a different purpose, um, as well as some brushes are handmade. So not to be a stomp about it, but a handmade brush is gonna give you maybe a little bit more finer detail. There's no right or wrong, depends on what works best for you. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, once let's say when I'm working with the studio and I decide that I want a brush to be a certain size, I'll actually give them down to the exact millimeter in length, diameter. Uh, we'll choose the hair because I have to think about the medium. That is the end of mine. And then from there we determine um, what they'll do is they'll basically make a mold. And it's all, you got ridges because it's all hand carved out. Mm -hmm. So once they make the mold, what they'll do is they'll take the hair that we choose. And for us, it's very important for us to work with what we call uh, virgin hair or the first cut. And that is basically grade A. Mm -hmm. It's the finest grade of natural hair. And that means, as you're saying, as the hair naturally grows, it begins to lose keratin, mm -hmm. causing the ends to become a little more tapered and naturally mm -hmm. soft. Um, that hair is then put upside down into the mold. At that point, it is tied. So you all hear like, oh, these are hand tied. Mm -hmm. So then it's tied. And then they pull that little, like, little like, uh, blossom of, of the brush head out and then I'll use a tool like this to groom out any excess. Mm -hmm. And then if it has to be shaped, if it's irregular, they actually pull it from the bottom. So the tips are never cut, and that's really important. Yeah. For the main reason, if someone does have sensitivity to brushes, um, or they're prone to breaking out, or getting like a little like uh, ingrowns, mm -hmm. or sometimes you'll see, like, especially in the cheek area, they think, oh, my blush is causing me to break out. Sometimes it's their brush. Okay. And what it is, is just, it's a more softer, natural application. Yeah, so that's definitely more of a labor of love, having yeah. to do it that way, because it'd be way easier to just give your brush a haircut. A little cut, exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Are any of your brushes dyed on the natural hair? No, they're all natural. Uh, well, that's not true. The Taclons have a little black tip to yeah. them. Yeah. Exactly. But pretty much you can see the consistency, or should I say the inconsist inconsistency of the natural hair that we use. We're very specific uh, with what parts of, or what grade of hair that we work with, uh, you and I are talking about goat. Yeah. You know, in America, goat isn't something that we commonly think of as, oh, I want a steak, I want a hamburger, I mm -hmm. want salmon. But goat is one of the top consumed, um, you know, byproducts worldwide. 
And it's interesting, on a pelt of goat, there's about 32 regions of hair that can be used for various different types of products. And there's about four or five that are very more specific to high-end makeup brushes. Yeah, I was reading that, like the, along the jaw or like the, jaw. the chest, there's some parts yep. of their belly. Your belly, the rump. Yeah. I mean, there's a few parts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was amazed because um, in a lot of the Japanese, when mm -hmm. they'll talk about the type of hair, I'm like, I don't know what that means. So I had to look up a whole yes. chart of where it was coming from. Right. And so because, you know, we're very specific from down to the breed and the type of hair, there's natural consistency just in the coloring. This one here is, um, has an X on it. We have a few brushes with an X and it's probably the highest grade of goat hair. Mm -hmm. It's from a very small little patch. And what it does, it actually feels like blue squirrel. But we know that a large squirrel hair brush like this doesn't have much cuticle and mm -hmm. that powder would go all over you. Yeah. Like when you're applying your powder. It'd be yeah, all over you, look at dangerous. Mm -hmm. Right. So this one actually has a little bit more of an open cuticle. So when you pick up your powder and you go to apply it, it's going to ensure that it goes where it's supposed to mm -hmm. and hopefully not here. Yeah. Actually, I, I thought this was blue squirrel because I've been using this for Feels my powder really and it's really soft. So it's a really more of a premium and it's definitely a little more of expensive grade of hair. It just depends on how you like to apply your, your, your powder. Some people like to use more of a scallop shape because they like to press and like walk it, walk mm -hmm. it to the outer corners. Some people like to dust downward. It just depends on how you like to apply your, your product. I like that one for the cat. The, the cap, when I'm going over oh, my creams, yeah, okay. because I like it, because I feel like sometimes like a cream, you know how it can have a little bit of a residue, I right. feel like I don't want to pick it up, so I use sure. this for my finishing powder, okay, like my hourglass sense. ambient lighting powders, Perfect. when I finish off with this, but I use this to set. To set, yeah. Sheila does it all the time, she loves to use this with the setting powder. I know, once I watch you guys, now that. I've picked up my habits, I'm like, nope, this brush is for this. <laughs> so it works good. I love that. So. What is normal, because occasionally when you do get a brand new handmade brush, you mm -hmm. can notice like maybe a hair or two oh, come sure. out, and, and that, that is normal, right? That's completely normal. I would say anywhere between up to the first three to five washings, I think, is what we generally say, is that you might have a few long hairs here and there. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference is, um, a couple things that are really important to know. If you have, and you're using a brush, you're using it for quite some time, and you learn that, or you see that you keep picking off little hairs on your face, it could be your, your application that you're using, it could be your technique. So I usually recommend just take your brush and I'm going to part it down in the middle, just as if you're parting your own hair. And by parting it in the middle, you almost divide it. And gently do this, please. <laughs> but you can gently divide it in, hair in half as if you're parting your own hair. And if you are starting to see when you move the, your fingers out, small little hairs popping up, that means you're actually breaking off the hair of your brush. So it's not that the brush is uh, poorly made or that the brush is falling apart. It means that maybe you are using this in that motion where the, it's not the most ideal. Mm -hmm. Some people like to pick up their blush and they like to grind it in circular motion. Mm -hmm. And I see sometimes with their tips, try a different shaped brush head mm -hmm. if, that's the, if that's how you like to apply your makeup. Um, try something a little bit more like a shorter dome, yeah. something, that's, something that's not so delicate. And that's a good way to kind of see, is it, is it the brush that's losing a hair because it's natural? But after a couple of washings, at one point, it should, um, should subside. Yeah. Unless if you are also cleaning it a little. Yeah, we got to talk about the cleaning because that, that's, that's important. So many people um, I watch will put those like little cups of the right. blue cleanser or right. whatever. The, really, the one that's basically like a, not right. short off of paint thinner. Right. <laughs> and they're cleaning their brushes in it. And if all you can help it, you sure. should always wash them at the sink. I mean, because a lot of them, yeah. I mean, obviously professional makeup artists, I think are aware of how to wash their sure. brushes. But for the at-home people, if right. you can wash them with water and soap, that's way better than those Absolutely. Really high I think, things. you know, we get phone calls and we all, of course, will naturally stand behind our brush. But when, I, when we talk through, and it's just because we are in the world of, 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 of being a consumer and we have so much information, who is really the expert? It's like fake news, right? Yeah. Right. So when it comes to what we recommend doing with the brushes, if you think about, let's say, natural hair brushes, natural hair brushes, natural hair brushes, naturally in between client care as a makeup artist, if you're going from one client to the next, then of course you have to do something like a quick sanita sanitational cleaning or sanitizing cleaning in between client so for instance we would recommend using one of the brush sprays mm -hmm. so i always recommend spray your tissue maybe two times you don't need a lot then just take your natural hair brush and just gently wipe from the base of the brush head down to the tips there shouldn't be a ton of makeup built up on the inside 
and that is fine for in between within seconds the alcohol the product will cause it to dry out that's why these kind of products have alcohol and oil mm -hmm. to help restore the pH balance and then within a few seconds it's ready to go to the next client mm -hmm. but never spray the brush directly it's very important because naturally any type of solvent I see people just go into town spraying spraying they saturate it this is naturally going to seep down into the ferrule and you have to think this is an alcohol-based product. Mm -hmm. An alcohol-based product is going to naturally begin to dissolve away any adhesive, mm -hmm. causing the ferrule, the brush head, everything start to come loose. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, what a terrible brush, look, it fell apart. Yeah. You know, and I can see when brushes are like, like these brushes are all like stained blue at the base. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay. <laughs> You're soaking and swirling, and if you soak anything long enough, even in water, something's gonna to begin to fall apart. Yeah. So for natural hair brushes, you know, in between a brush spray is fine, but otherwise, at the end of your day, you should be using a mild, gentle shampoo and just slightly massaging. Mm -hmm. It's so funny, we, well, it's not funny, but I always say, uh, brushes are not dishwasher safe, mm -hmm. they're not microwavable, yeah. and they should never, you should never put a blow dryer to them. Yeah. And it sounds quite comical and almost common sense, but sometimes when you're in a rush, you do crazy things. Yeah. And, um, well, let's not do that for your own sake. Yeah, treat them with love. Treat them with love. Now, a natural hair, a uh, synthetic hairbrush, I usually don't recommend ever using a spray cleaner because if you've ever um, bought anything made of acrylic, which this is plastic, um, whether it is acrylic piece of furniture or anything acrylic, the first thing it says, do not clean with alcohol because mm -hmm. over time, alcohol is going to begin to make this like acrylic unit begin to brittle and it will crack and break apart. It almost starts to look um, like it's almost melting. Melting, in a frosted, way. Yeah, exactly. frosted. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. Um, and when you think about that, well, this is plastic. Mm -hmm. It's acrylic. Yeah. So just like with acrylic nails, you know, if, you, if you're using alcohol or acetone, acetone just derivative yeah. of it, it's going to be, that's how you remove it. So doing that is going to cause a synthetic hairbrush to naturally begin to break apart, fray, and then that's when it starts feeling really jagged on the skin. Mm -hmm. So for these, they're plastic. Just wash them with soap and water. Yeah. Literally. Sometimes, in doubt, Dawn detergent. <laughs> takes I like the African you know, black soap. African black soap that's is awesome. really you good. That's awesome. You get a big right. block for like four dollars. It's super easy, or just any kind of like you know, Ooh, yeah, any of the good. the cleansers are really nice, and they work really good. But like especially like in between client use, yeah. like if we're doing a wedding or we're backstage, normally a makeup artist would have several sets. But at one point, the assistants, I just have them run to the bathroom and just clean them. Mm -hmm. They'll dry really fast. It's plastic. Yeah. So uh, what about drying? Because I see some people, it's important not to get the water as they're drying. Because I see some people stick them back in their cups like this yes. and then the water will go into the ferro. Never do that. Um, so that's a big thing. So after you basically have, uh, let's say you've, you've have shampooed your brush mm -hmm. uh, what you want to do is take a little bit of your cloth and you kind of just lightly press out any excess mm -hmm. and then I find it very important then to groom your brush back into its natural shape and then just lay a towel flat mm -hmm. and let your brushes dry flat um, just laying like this I've seen people do very creative things with um, rubber bands hanging mm -hmm. them down that's fine too yeah. and they even have i think that brush drying tree stand yeah no i i to got each his own. i got a i got a really expensive one i got one and i brought it from sigma and i was thinking yes i'm gonna put no trying to shove all your brushes <laughs> in that thing right, it's right. like a three-tiered tree i'm like why did i buy this because i know sometimes it's bad like in the beginning when i first got some natural hair brushes i was conditioning them yeah. Because I was thinking it was helping keep the, the hair not brittle, but sure. then the more I thought about it, I'm like, if you want the cuticle and I'm coating it with like a silicone or whatever else, right. else is in my conditioner, it's not right. going to perform the same. I would recommend if you just have a good all-purpose, you know, brush shampoo or a basic shampoo, that's fine. I don't really think you have to go and start conditioning them. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then maybe you're using a shampoo that's a little too strong. Mm -hmm. Like the big fallacy is, um, oh, I'm going to just use baby shampoo. Baby heads are very acidic. Mm. And as an adult, if you actually go to use baby shampoo in your own hair, it will dry it out. Okay. So the worst, one of the worst things you could use would be baby shampoo on a natural hairbrush. Mm. I did not so know let's that. Not That's do nice that. to know. Yeah, because I've heard a lot of people say right. use baby shampoo. There's something else I'm seeing out there, and it's cool if it works for you. You know, everything's cool to each his own. But I see now these, like, little drying tools that look kind of like a, a drill bit. Yes, and it's whipping it And it's it like, woo, and it's like going on a big spin. To each his own, if that's what you like, um, brushes should blossom. Mm -hmm. So when you buy a brush, it's going to be really tight. Mm -hmm. And brushes, naturally, you have to think about this, is that over the time of use, a brush should blossom about a third 
in its size, a third, mm -hmm. not double in its yeah. size. So um, when you look at a brush, you're thinking, oh, I need it for this type of you know, little space. Know that it's gonna get a little bit fuller. But when you use a brush that does one of these and it starts looking like a, mm -hmm. like a big- Like an electrical socket, right. like you said It's cool, in. that's fine if you like your brushes being really full and really mm -hmm. big. Um, so to each his own, but I, I personally, I would just rather just, I just actually, like I said, just wring them out, let them lie flat, and I'll put the brush guards on them, which mm -hmm. are great. Yeah. And especially for the bigger brush, it just keeps them from, you know, blossoming yeah. too big. And it really should be fine. I think brushes can be, um, sometimes in one's mind, a hassle. Some makeup artists love washing their brushes because it's our moment of silence mm -hmm. after they've had a hectic day. Yeah. And nothing feels as good as when, like, all your brushes are clean. Yeah. Well, I actually love, when I used to have to wash them on my hand, I didn't like it. And mm -hmm. I got one of those, just you can even get them on Amazon, an inexpensive little silicone mat. Yeah. Or like a little glove sure. thing where you put on, and that way it's like my hand was just never easy. feeling raw or right. gross. And so I could do them all at once. That works. to dry, and then in the morning when I go to do my makeup, they're all dry. I would say probably the little silicone ones are a little more gentle. I've seen some like hard nubby plastic ones. I'm like... Yeah, no, this is just, it almost looks perfect. like an oven mitt. That's perfect. And it just has a little bit of texture on there, so that's I can good. just do it. And then I can squeeze the water out and then lay them up to dry. Easy enough. So with Melissa, she has more of a fair to medium skin tone, and we're going to begin with working with the complexion by color correcting under the eye. We're going to work with the fixed cream in light medium, and we're going to work with a little synthetic brush by Isom called T41. This brush here is elongated and made of synthetic hair designed to really mimic almost like a fingernail because it's designed to really fit and contour directly under the eye with the least amount of pressure. So I'm picking up the fixed cream. We're just gonna begin by pressing under the eye and just pat on the concealer. And what I like to do is follow with the finishing sponge. This is a latex-free and silicone-free sponge. And just be working with the little diamond tip, just do a light little press to diffuse the edges. with the same on the other eye. Notice how I'm pressing. You do not want to rub your corrector. You want to lightly just press it so it becomes one with the skin. The next step to prepare the skin, I'm going to work with and release the Lay Creme Concentrate, and I'm going to apply it with it's a long synthetic hairbrush. Now, I like to use a brush as a makeup artist working on someone. It feels much more comfortable, and I'm not putting product on my hands. For yourself, if you want to just use your fingers to apply your moisturizer, just, just be careful of your nails. So as you can see, I start through the center, working with the side of the brush head, never the tips, and just glide downward in long strokes. Most has beautiful skin, but like most of us, with a little bit of redness around the nose and around the mouth, we'll be able to color correct that just with our foundation shade alone. Next step is going to be working with the Ket Liquid Foundation, and this is the Hydro Base. It's a water-based fluid, and I'm going to mix two shades. This is the O3 and the R3, and together it will create a neutral, which will be perfect for her, her complexion. And then once again, I'm going to follow with the same brush, the T45. Start by working in the area that you want to achieve the most amount of coverage. I like to start through the cheeks, around the nose through the T-zone, and then blend down in long strokes. This way the foundation becomes sheer as it begins to move down along the jawline. You'll find that with the synthetic brush, especially with this one in a filbert shape, that you actually have some nice give, what we call bend, and it'll move back into place. So as you can see, it just hugs the contours and glides down. There's no part of the ferrule or the metal piece that's touching the skin. So it keeps it in line and ready to go as you move through the different contours of the face. A little extra around the nose, above the lip, the bridge of the nose, just to build a little bit more coverage. The next step is to take your finishing sponge and work with the flat edge. And we're using it dry we're going to begin by pressing and rolling your sponge over the face, 
This allows the foundation to become one with the skin. If you find that your foundation gives more coverage than you would like, when you dampen your sponge, it'll actually allow your foundation to become more sheer. The next step, we're gonna set the foundation with a setting powder. This is the Cat Set Powder, and I'm gonna use a long, soft dome brush. This is the X51. This hair will give you more of a sheer application with control. So what you wanna do is you wanna apply the powder evenly distributed through the brush. And then from there, just begin to press and let the brush head just glide down over the contours of the face. If you notice, I'm not taking the brush and aggressively rubbing it or stippling it all over the skin. You don't want to move the foundation, you want to set it. If you tend to have a little bit more of an oily T-zone or an oilier complexion, you can give yourself a second shot of powder through the T-zone. For smaller areas, I just pick up a smaller brush. This one's G29, made of a soft goat hair brush. And we're gonna go ahead and set under the eye. Around the corners of the nose. Corners of the mouth. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the eye makeup. And today we're gonna to be working with a new trend palette from Viseart. This one's called Trist. And this, you can see, has a beautiful combination of both warm and cool tones from matte to some of your metallics. What we'll be doing today is showing you how, by using soft brushes, you're going to achieve a more natural look. And then by working with brushes that have a little bit more cuticle, like sable brushes, you'll get a fuller application. So you can say to take you from day to play or soft to dramatic. Before we go into the eyeshadow, I'm gonna basically prime the eyelid, working with the Viseart Shadow Primer working with a larger synthetic filbert brush. Yeah. Start with your primer by patting across the lash line and then work what's left on your brush up to under the brow. A shadow primer is gonna to help to keep your eyeshadow in place and keep it from creasing. This eye primer was created with no iron oxides and no mica. The benefit of that is that there's absolutely no color. So therefore, what color shadow you choose to use will actually be very color true. Sometimes when you're working with a shadow primer that has a little bit of pigment in it, yes, it'll neutralize the eyelid, but then when you go to put your shadow on top of it, your shadow may turn a secondary or tertiary color. This primer will keep your colors true and keep your eyeshadows in place. Into the eye area, I'm working with a soft peach tone and you can see that I'm pressing it, starting at the base of the lash line, using the side of what we call a scalloped brush head, and pressing it. You want to ensure that your first initial shadow and your shadow primer become one. To show something with a little more of a dramatic impact, I'm gonna work with a sable hair brush. This is W25. This brush has a brush hair that has a little bit more cuticle. That's gonna give you a fuller application. This is great for evening or for someone who likes a fuller makeup look. Also too, if you have a darker skin tone and you're looking to get a more impact with your eye makeup, using a sable hair brush is gonna give you fuller application. If you find that you have oilier eyelids, and they tend to, your makeup tends to crease. Working with a sable hairbrush once again can help give a little bit more impact and more lay down. So as you can see, this is the exact same eyeshadow, but just by applying it with a different textured hair, you actually are seeing a little bit more of the lay down of the pigment. see this eye has a little more of a sheerness, a little bit more of a very light cast, where this you're starting to see some of the peach tone come forward. Next, we're gonna work with a smaller goat hair brush, the G27, and this is for a soft wash of color across the lid. From here, we'll go into a little bit of this soft 
peach shimmer and start by pressing this across the lid. For the other eye, now we're gonna work with the W21, similar in shape, but this one is made of the same uh, texture of hair as the large one, which is sable. You can immediately see that with working with a brush that has a more open cuticle, it's laying down more pigment, giving a more color range. For the shape of Melissa's eye, she has more of a medium to narrow eye space with uh, a more narrow lid space. So by keeping the light color with texture on the lid, it's gonna create the illusion of a more open eye area. Next, we're gonna work with this deep chocolate hue with a soft hair brush. This one's made of squirrel. This is S33. Pick up the pigment just on the tips, flick off any excess, and we can use this to create a little bit of a soft contour by letting the brush just glide back and forth right along the natural eye socket. This is a very classic brush shape, often referred to as a watercolor brush. That's because the hairs are really long and really soft. I'm being very strategic in my application here to create the most dimension for her eye shape. Notice that it's just the tips of the brush head that are moving back and forth. There's not a lot of movement with the brush hairs itself. Let your brushes do the work for you. So now <laughs> as intense as this looks, I'm a, I will go back to the G29 with nothing on the brush and we'll, we will use this to blend and diffuse. By blending and diffusing it upward onto the eye socket, it almost naturally creates your transition color. Open for a second again. And you can see how soft that is. The next eye to get a little bit more of a dramatic impact will work with the W35. This is made of sable. You can see this has almost a calligraphy style tipped head where it's short and it becomes more of an angle. You work with the longest part into the socket, letting the angle glide and hug over the bone. First set up your color, almost as if you were creating a cut crease. And then let the brush glide back and forth along the ridge. This is the same shade of shadow that we used here, but as you can see, working with a brush that has more cuticle it's gonna give you a stronger lay down of color. And I'm just diffusing with this brush, creating a little more of an inner contour. So now when it comes to lining the eye, I'm gonna be working with a dark pigment here. I'm gonna work with a square edge, little synthetic brush called T05. This brush here gives a technique that we call a tight line. You're working with nice strong pigments, 
You can basically use this dry or you can dampen it with a medium transformer. I'll look down to that corner. And we just touch, touch, touch. And just let the brush touch right into the root of the lash line. Look to the side. Now a tight line can be done, look straight to the camera, under the lash line. But in this case, for her eye shape, I'm gonna keep it really tight right along the top of the lash line. This will give the illusion of a thicker, fuller lash without taking up any of the lid space, keeping the eye nice and open. And actually that gives a very natural, tight line. So on this side, I'll just go a little thicker to balance the intensity of the makeup. So as you can see, we use the same deep brown color, both as our eyeliner and through the contour of the eye. So depending on your makeup style, this with a little mascara could be enough for the eye, or we can bring a little bit more of a delicate smudge beneath the eye. So to create a little bit of a soft smudge under the eye, I'm gonna work with this soft brush here. This is S31. And we'll go a little bit into this bronze shimmer and create a little bit of a soft shading, just a little bit of a halo. Wiping my brush off, making sure there's nothing on it, I'm now gonna use it just to diffuse, to soften the edges. This eye, if you wanted a little more intensity, I'm gonna go back with my T05 brush, and we're gonna start by just pressing along the bottom of the lash line, same as we did along the top. This is a great technique to use, especially if you feel like you don't have a steady hand to do eyeliner. Just let the brush do all the work for you. Now we're gonna use the same brush we used here, S31, and just diffuse the edge. Obviously, as you can see, Melissa has a little mascara on her eye. But what I'll do now is just touch up her lashes by working with the mascara fan brush. This has two types of hair. This is a little bit of a natural synthetic that's really soft. And then the dark, what you see, are the actual nylon fibers that are in mascara wands. So it's two types of synthetics. This will give lift and that will give length. So from here, I'm going to use the mascara fan brush and just lightly paint the lashes. Moving on to creating a little dimension around the frame of the face, I'm gonna work with the Viseart palette. This one here has a highlight, a blush, and a bronzer, and this is a blaze. And I will do all with the G53, and this is gonna give a really soft application. We're gonna start with a little bit of the bronze tone, and just lightly go along her cheekbones, a little bit into the hairline. Just let the brush just glide right along the bones. Your brush glide back and forth along the cheekbone to the temples, or the hairline, maybe a little bit along the jawline. We usually recommend keeping the bronzer blush toward the side of the plane of the face opposed to going onto the center. Use the arch of the eyebrow down to the center of your cheek as your guide to keep color clear from this area. Soft wash of color. Just let it glide right onto the cheekbone. And then to highlight, right on top of the cheekbone. This is gonna give a very soft sheen. Now on this side of the face, we're gonna come in and to balance the intensity of the eye makeup, we're gonna work with the Viseart Sculpt and Highlight Palette, working with P55. As you can see, this brush has a little bit of a domed head and a little bit of an angle designed to basically glide right along and hug the cheekbone. I'm gonna mix a little bit of these two shades here. And then just starting at the outer corner, almost at this part of the ear, Set your shape up, Q, 
keeping it at the arch of the brow. I recommend going a little bit on the softer side. It's easier to add than to take away. To your finishing sponge and just diffuse out the edge so you don't see a hard line. And then diffuse once more with the brush and the elongated the bottom should be the shortest, that's going to give you the most amount of coverage and then by going to the long along the bone it's going to basically glide and diffuse. Roll on the draw line. And a little bit along the hairline. Now due to the amount of space here, you don't want to make it too narrow by putting a lot of contour. But in order to keep it looking as if it's a racing stripe, you basically want to have some form of consistency along the planes of the face. Now to highlight, I'm going to mix a little bit of these two shades, just right along the top of the cheekbone. Depending on how intense you would like your highlighter, you can choose a brush that has a little bit of a, of a soft hair for sheer application, or go into a more intentional tool like the W25 made of sable and this will give you a little bit more of an intensified highlight. Now because she is a fair to medium tone, I'm mixing between these two shades to highlight and I mix between these two shades to contour. Stephanie likes to call it the galactic mm -hmm. highlight, space. seen from space. So now I'm going to define the lips. This is the Kevin O'Quan pencil in medium. And just to lightly etch around the outline of the lip. Just working with the point going back and forth, back and forth, allow your pencil to inch its way around the line of the mouth, creating a natural shape. Now I'm going to work with the W19. This is a rounded filbert brush made of sable. And I like to blend the lip liner out before I apply any lip color. So as your lip color begins to wear, you're not left with a hard line. From here, I'm going to move to the Muse Nude Lip Palette. I'm going to work with a soft peach tone. Start your lip color by pressing it on at the center of the mouth. So it gives you the most staining power. Then begin to blend outward to the corners. And there's the complete look. So as you can see, by working with hairs that are a little bit more texturous, like sable, you're gonna get a fuller application and working with softer hairs, goat and squirrel, you're gonna get a more sheer application. So really, working with the same palette, it's up to you what tools you wanna to use to achieve the best look. So now we have our beautiful Ranya here, and we're gonna do something a little bit more dramatic with something new from Viseart. We're gonna add a little bit of hydration with the Ember Lease by Creme, working with the T45. First, we're gonna color correct with the Medium Fixed Cream Color Corrector for under the eye. And we're going to use the T37. This is a synthetic hair brush that has a little bit of a rounded angle. You'll find, you'll see the way I use this actually can get, achieve a little more coverage under the eye. Just right into the well. And use the tip of the brush head that has the angle and just glide over the eye area. go into the larger 38 and use that just to blend and diffuse away the edges. Synthetic brushes are great for cream mediums. Or liquids. I'm going to take a little bit of the setting powder 
onto the flat edge and just press it right on top of the color corrector. For Ronnie's foundation, we're gonna work with the fixed cream in the N4, and we're gonna apply it with the T47. The T is a series of brushes in Esam that are all synthetic. And as I mentioned earlier, this is gonna be beautiful for applying a cream medium. So with the top of the dome of the brush, I'm just gonna glide the brush. Gliding your brush, let your brush do all the work gliding over the planes of the face working in a downward motion is ideal for a more even application because you're getting a consistent lay down. When you're buffing your brush, you're gonna find that you're gonna be layering, creating a circular motion, causing the medium to begin to roll microscopically. So just glide across the face and down, which also will help if there's any light vellus hairs. Still on this side. What's great about the fixed cream is you can adjust the coverage to create a little more coverage through the center of the face and then shear out along the jawline. We're going to work with the Cat Set Powder and we'll work with the T49. The synthetic domed head brush will give you more of a medium application. Brush you can work with the actual tips. The fixed cream foundation will naturally give the skin not only a flexible coverage, but also a beautiful glow to the skin. If you're looking for more of a matte finish, stick with the liquids. For more strategic application, I'm going to go with the W25 and come into the smaller areas to get a little bit more of an exact setting. So now we're going to work with the new Theory palette from Viseart called Absinthe beautiful tones, you have three mattes and three of the metallics, and you have an array of rich jewel tones and greens from a soft metallic celery to a really deep emerald to a really dark matte hunter green. First, we're gonna start by using the shadow primer from Viseart, working with the synthetic T43. Apply the primer across the lash line, working up to under the brow. Use a very small amount and let it just set for a few moments and dry before you move on to your shadows. Because we want the most impact, I'm gonna actually start with the metallic celery and working with W21. This is gonna give us full impact across the lid. So I'm going to keep the light shade going across the lash line, right past the pupil of the eye, and on both sides. Next step, working with the same brush, W21, I'm going to go into the deep metallic emerald, and focus on the outer corner, keeping to the roundness of her natural eye shape. Now I'm gonna work with the T39. It's a synthetic flat squared brush, and I'm gonna use this as my diffusing tool. I wanna be a little more strategic. I don't wanna blend the green up above the ridge. So just the blending where the two shades meet. Next what I'll do is mix a little bit of these two light tones with G29, just to lightly soften the highlight under the brow. Next up, I'll work with the W35 and a little bit of this 
mocha just to create a little bit of a soft contour. Just let the largest, the longest part of the brush head fit right into the contour of the eye and move the brush back and forth in a windshield wiper motion. I'm going to work with the deepest shade of green, that is matte. I'm going to work with the T03, it's a long synthetic, fine pointed brush. I'm going to use a medium transformer and turn this into a liquid. We're going to start working at the inner corner. Letting the brush just glide along the base of the lash line. Coming to the outer corner. In the Eason line, there are two liner brushes. The W01, which is made of sable, will give a very, very fine liner, very fine wing. Whereas the T03 made of synthetic hair will give you an immediately a thicker type of design. Go ahead and bring a little bit of shading at the bottom of the eye with the brown. I'm gonna go with the soft brush now, the 31, to create just a soft halo. Just to point. Now I'm just going to diffuse the edges. This is with the W21. Now working with the metallic celery, working with S31. Okay. Just to give a little bit of an inner highlight. So now we're going to go move on to lashes. We're going to go with the lashes in a box, style E1. These are basically three lashes that have been hand tied together into one full strip. So it gives a very wispy effect, and we're gonna uh, work with the callus lash adhesive. So a couple different ways you can apply your lash glue is obviously you can apply it directly to your lash. You can also work with the W01 brush and apply it as if it was liquid liner. Chin up, look down. So what I love about this lash adhesive is that it is almost an opaque or opalescent adhesive that darkens. And as it turns to a dark blue, that it is the time for you to apply your lash. As you can see, it's getting darker. It's the perfect amount of tact. So now I'm just going to go to the ablaze and add just a little bit of warmth. When you have this much going on with the eye, you want to let the focus drawn into the eyes. So I'm going to use just a little bit of the bronzer from ablaze and just lightly glide right over the bones to create a little bit of dimension, but keep it really soft. So first I'm gonna work with the Kevin Aquan pencil in medium, just to lightly define around the edge. I'm working with W19. I mix a little bit of these two colors here, which are more on the neutral side onto the lip to create a very monochromatic, very sexy nude look. 
When wearing a nude lip, it pairs beautifully with a fuller eye makeup look as we've done here. The one most important piece is gonna be to balance it all together with what you have on your cheeks or bronzer. Touch W35. <coughs> Just to bring a little bit of natural shading from the inner contour down to the side of the nose. So there we have our look with the new Viseart Theory palette in Absinthe. What's really great about this is that you have your three matte tones, a great all over. This is great neutral for contour, a really deep rich hunter green for lining the eye. And then again you have a mixture of satin and metallics. This has both a warm and a cool tone green, which makes it so universal that almost anyone can wear it. Thank you.